You know, when you sent in that YouTube video about King Lear, I have to admit, my interest was immediately piqued. Ooh. The idea that Christopher Marlowe, not William Shakespeare, might be the true author. Well, it's a theory that definitely got my attention. It really makes you think about how obsessed we still are with Shakespeare's identity, doesn't it? Centuries later, we're still wondering if Shakespeare was really more than one person. Yeah, and with King Lear, it feels like there's even more room for that kind of speculation. But before we really get into it, let's set the stage a bit. For anyone who might not remember every detail of Elizabethan playwrights, who was Christopher Marlowe and why is he linked to Shakespeare? Right, so Christopher Marlowe was basically a rock star in the Elizabethan theater scene at the same time as Shakespeare. His plays were really popular and his writing style was seen as powerful, maybe even a little dangerous. But the thing is, he died young in 1593 and his death was, well, kind of mysterious. And that's before some of Shakespeare's most famous plays, even King Lear, were published. So we have this really interesting timeline. A great playwright dies and then suddenly these masterpieces appear. It does make you wonder, right? Definitely. And that's where King Lear comes into play. The video you sent in focuses on how similar the text of the 1608 quarto of King Lear, that's like an early edition, is to a play that was registered way back in 1594 called The True Chronicle History of King Lear. Unfortunately, that earlier play is lost, but we have those registration records and they hint at a connection to King Lear. Okay, so when we talk about these textual similarities, what exactly do we mean? I mean, weren't plays about kings and tragedies pretty common back then? Sure, but we're not just talking about shared themes here. This is about things like character names that are in both plays, plot points that are almost the same, even lines of dialogue that are nearly identical. It's hard to believe it's all just coincidence. Like literary deja vu. And here's where the video really grabbed my attention. If Shakespeare is the only one who wrote King Lear, why would he borrow so much from another play, especially one that wasn't that famous? And what about all the revisions and changes between that early quarto and the version we see in the first folio after Shakespeare died? You're hitting on the big questions that are driving this whole debate about who wrote the play. The video argues that these aren't just borrowed elements, they're clues left by the true author, Christopher Marlowe. All right, so let's talk about those clues. The video calls them hidden clues, which honestly is a great way to put it. For example, throughout the 1608 King Lear, there are little hints of themes and even specific lines from Marlowe's plays, like Hero and Leander and Dido, Queen of Carthage. It's almost like he's hiding secret messages for people to find. Like a little wink to anyone who knows what to look for. But if Marlowe was really trying to stay hidden, wouldn't that be a risky move? You would think so. But the video suggests that these were deliberate clues, meant to be found by the right people, a way for Marlowe to say, hey, this is mine, but without revealing himself completely. It goes deeper than that, though. There's a character, Perilous, in the early King Lear, who later becomes the Earl of Kent in the more well-known versions. Perilous, then Kent. Okay, I follow. What's so important about this character for this theory? The video draws a parallel between Perilous, or Kent, and Marlowe's own life, and it's pretty interesting. Both of them experience a kind of exile, they both take on new identities, and there's even this element of hiding their true selves through language. So Marlowe, being in hiding and maybe even living a double life, poured those experiences into King Lear through this character. It's kind of a sad idea when you think about it, someone feeling like they can only be themselves in their art. Absolutely. And the video says that this personal connection is why the writing feels so real and raw. They argue that only someone who had gone through something like that could write with such depth of emotion. And it doesn't end there, does it? The video then focuses on the character of Edgar, suggesting that he could even be a stand-in for Marlowe himself. I've always thought Edgar was one of the most interesting characters, maybe even more so if it really is Marlowe. So this part really got my attention. Yeah, Edgar's story is really important to this theory. You see, just like Marlowe supposedly had to hide who he was and live in disguise, Edgar also takes on a new identity as poor Tom, pretending to be a homeless beggar who's lost his mind. The video points out how Edgar's monologues are full of pain and sadness about losing himself, being forced to hide, and always being afraid of being caught. All things that would have resonated with Marlowe if he was in hiding. So it's like the video is saying that Marlowe is basically writing his own story through Edgar in King Lear, using him to talk about his own life. There's even that one line they highlight, Edgar, I nothing am. That line is so powerful, it really makes you think there's something more to it. Right. Edgar, I nothing am. 
It's like a key piece of the puzzle for this theory. The video thinks it's a double meaning, a hidden message about an author who's using a fake name. Like nothing stands for that fake identity, the Shakespeare mask he's wearing. That's a pretty bold interpretation. Yeah. But considering all the other connections, it's hard to just ignore it. And it doesn't stop there. They don't just look at the text and the characters. The video even brings up the setting of King Lear as a clue. So what about the location? Why is it important? They focus on the way the Dover Cliffs are described in King Lear. They argue that the descriptions are so detailed and specific that it feels like someone who's actually been there wrote them. And here's the thing. There's no evidence that Shakespeare ever went to Dover. However, for Marlowe, Dover was a meaningful place. His mom's family was from Dover, and it's likely he spent time there as a kid. So they're saying that Marlowe used his own memories of Dover when he wrote the play, and someone who'd never been there couldn't have written it with so much detail. Exactly. And remember how we talked about Edgar maybe being a stand-in for Marlowe? Well, Edgar is the one who gives the most vivid descriptions of the Dover Cliffs. It's like, through Edgar, Marlowe is putting himself right into the play, literally and figuratively. This whole thing is one big puzzle, isn't it? Every piece seems small on its own, but when you put them all together, they actually paint a pretty convincing picture. Speaking of puzzles, we have to talk about that Merlin connection. I mean, I get the whole King Arthur legend, but what's Merlin doing in King Lear? Ah, yes, the Merlin connection. It's one of the most interesting parts of this theory, even if it is a bit out there. So back when Marlowe was at Cambridge, his classmates used to call him Merlin, probably because he was smart and a bit of a rebel. Okay, so Marlowe was already linked to Merlin, but how does that connect to the play itself? Well, in King Lear, there's this scene where the fool, you know, that character who seems silly but is actually really insightful, quotes a prophecy that's supposed to be from Merlin. Now, you could just say it's a common folktale thrown into the story, but the video suggests that this Merlin reference is another one of those deliberate clues pointing to Marlowe. So it's not just that King Lear is about hidden identities. The play itself could be a disguise, a way for Marlowe, the Merlin of Elizabethan theater, yeah. to keep writing even though he's in hiding. You got it. It's a pretty wild idea, to say the least. And when you consider that Marlowe was thought to be an atheist, which was really dangerous back then, maybe even punishable by death, it makes even more sense that he'd use a fake name and hide clues to his real identity in his writing. It's like a whole other play happening behind the scenes in Elizabethan England. You can't help but wonder if Marlowe was so scared, maybe even for his life, because of his beliefs, that he felt this was his only way to keep writing. So after all that, after looking at all the clues and the historical connections, where do we even begin to unpack this? It's a lot to take in. It really is. And it shows you how much interpretation plays a role when we're talking about literature, don't you think? Two people can look at the same thing, like that line, Edgar I nothing am, and see completely different things. Absolutely. Context is so important. But even then, there's always room for debate. Let's say, just for a moment, that we entertain this theory. If Marlowe really did write an early version of King Lear, how did it end up being known as a Shakespeare play? What happened? Well, that's where things get really uncertain. Some scholars have suggested that Marlowe, even though he was supposedly in hiding, never stopped writing. Maybe he sent plays to acting companies anonymously, even to Shakespeare's company. Others think that maybe he knew he was in danger or that he didn't have much time left, so he gave his unfinished plays to Shakespeare directly. A secret exchange of literary genius. No, that would be an incredible story. Mm -hmm. Right. The problem is, like with a lot of theories about this time period, we just don't have enough concrete proof to say for sure. But it's still really interesting to think about these possibilities. Imagine a whole hidden world of Elizabethan theater, where authors are secret, collaborations happen in the shadows, and amazing plays come from dangerous secrets. It makes you rethink everything you thought you knew about that time. This whole conversation has totally changed how I see King Lear and the idea of authorship in Elizabethan England. And that's what's so great about exploring these kinds of alternative theories, you know? It reminds us that even the works we call classics, the ones everyone knows, can still hold surprises. They can still have hidden layers of meaning waiting to be uncovered. It encourages us to keep asking questions, even about things written centuries ago. I totally agree. It's like this video gives a new perspective. We're looking at the same play, the same people, but suddenly we're seeing things we never noticed before. And it really gets you thinking. What other secrets are hidden in the pages of history's greatest works? Who are the real people behind the words that still speak to us all these years later?
Those are great questions. And those are questions that scholars will probably still be debating for centuries to come. I think that's the power of these unsolved mysteries. They remind us that the past isn't really gone. History is a mix of fact and what we imagine, and the stories we tell about the past affect how we see the world today. It all comes back to what you were saying before, that how we interpret things depends on who we are. It keeps these plays alive, keeps us talking about them, debating who wrote them, what they mean, how they were created, who knows? Maybe someday, someone will find that one missing piece of evidence that finally proves or disproves this whole theory. But until then, it's our job to keep looking, keep asking questions, and keep the conversation going. Exactly. So the next time you pick up King Lear or any play by Shakespeare, you might find yourself listening for echoes of Marlowe, looking for those little hints and thinking about the mysteries surrounding these famous works. And honestly, that's what makes these deep dives so great. They give us something to think about, something to spark our imaginations. We may not have all the answers, but the journey, the exploration of these ideas is what makes it so rewarding. So until next time, keep those minds open and keep those thinking caps on.